the Mission Control Center. The building that you're in and the room that you were looking at are two very special places here at JSC. This is where, since 1965, all of NASA's manned spaceflight missions have been controlled. Now, we have more than one room in the building, so if we were to go through that door, head down the hallway, and up one more flight of stairs, we would reach Flight Control Room 2. Flight Control Room 2 was used to control the Gemini flights and the Apollo missions that took us to the moon. All nine of them. Apollo 8, 10, through 17 were all missions to our nearest celestial neighbor. After the Apollo program ended, we moved downstairs to a room that is also over that way, just on this floor, so all you have to do is go through the door and down a hallway about 100 feet, and you'll reach Flight Control Room 1. Today, it is the International Space Station Control Room, manned 24-7, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, because we always have people who are living and working on board the ISS, conducting scientific research that can only be performed in low Earth orbit, in space. Now, before it became the Space Station Room, it had a fair bit of history behind it as well. We controlled Skylab, our very first space station from there, and then on July the 18th, 1975, a Russian Soyuz spacecraft and an American Apollo spacecraft met in low Earth orbit. The two vehicles linked and docked, and the crews opened the hatch and shook hands, meeting in peace during the heat of the Cold War. Then, on April 12, 1981, on the 20th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's first human flight into space, NASA launched a truly remarkable new vehicle. Her name was Columbia, and this is the beginning of the shuttle program. The first shuttle flights were controlled from Flight Control Room 1 and 2 until 1996, when Flight Control Room 2 was retired and restored to the way it looked in the 60s, when we were flying to the moon. Flight Control Room 1 was relegated to backup mission operations for this room, Flight Control Room White, controlling STS-70 in July of 1996. And it controlled from STS-70 all the way to the end of the shuttle program, STS-135. The shuttle program ended on July the 21st, 2011, at 4.59 in the morning when the shuttle Atlantis pulled into port at runway 3 in the Kennedy Space Center for the final time. Now, just because this remarkable vehicle is done flying does not mean that we are done exploring space. Not by a long shot. We have a lot of work to do. We still have the space station conducting scientific research for the next almost 10 years until 2020. Uh, at the very least, though, it's probably going to last a little bit longer than that. And we're also working on a brand new spacecraft called the Orion. It's going to take us out beyond low Earth orbit again. Hopefully it will be ready to fly by 2017. Very shortly after its first few orbital test missions, it's going to take us out into deep space to fly around the moon again to make sure that its interplanetary legs can allow it to walk out that far. Which I think is pretty cool if you think about it. At that point, it'll have been about 50 years since we had gone out to the moon. When we did it back then, it was pushing the envelope of our technology, our ingenuity, our engineering, and our human capability, as well as testing the meaning of the word impossible. And now, in the very near future, it's going to be a test mission. My, how far we have come. So, to go farther and push the envelope more, we're going to fly 10 million miles away from our home, a factor of 40 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. We're going to go visit asteroids and comets. No one has ever been there before. We're going to take a look at them and try and learn about how the inner solar system formed. That, of course, includes our own home. And maybe get some clues as to how life got started down here on this nice little blue and white marble. And also, while we're flying there, we will learn how to traverse interplanetary space more safely, quickly, and accurately than ever before. Which is something that we need to know how to do just a little bit better than we do now if we want to have a manned mission to Mars be possible by the mid to late 2030s, very latest, early 2040s. No matter where we have been, though, or where we are, or where we're going in space, it will always require an enormous team effort to achieve our goals in this business. It requires a global support structure to fly in space. But from when the engines light in Florida to when the tr crew returns safely home to the Earth, that support structure begins and ends in one of the rooms in this building. Each control room has its own collection of consoles, and here there are 23 of them. And each console is devoted to one specific set of systems, one discipline of manned spaceflight that must be carefully monitored and controlled. Now you can kind of group these different systems and disciplines into one of three sections in the room. Over here on this side, all these consoles are devoted to us, people. What we need to fly in space and the systems that support us. 
over here on this side of the room, the vehicle and what it needs to fly in space and all the systems that support it <coughs> and its payloads. Last but not least is the trench, the front row. These are the rocket scientists. These are the folks that will guide you into space and guide you home from space and, of course, guide you to your targets in space, which might be a satellite or a space station. And I say a space station, not the space station, because one day not too far away from now, we are going to have more than one up there. More nations and even private companies. Because we are entering into the age of a new industrial revolution. Not of this Earth, but of space. The preview of low Earth orbit is going to become more and more the area of private industry. For them to build space stations, to leave space to countries, to private research firms, to universities, to do scientific research that is wholly unique to the environment of space to maintain our satellite infrastructures that support our 21st century society, and to do some unmanned deep exploration and scientific experiments all the way out there, like testing out which lunar landing trajectory is the most fuel efficient, might be something people need to know if we want to go back to the moon. But as far as exploration goes, what NASA is concerned with, as aforementioned, the moon, asteroids and comets are on the list, as well as Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars, and of course the planet Mars itself. After that, it's the outer solar system, and heading out to the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, Callisto, Ganymede, Io, Titan, Europa. Some of the more interesting places to visit in our solar system aren't even the planets themselves, but their moons, particularly Europa, has the best chance of, other than the planet Earth, harboring life in our very own neighborhood. And then, after that, maybe one day, 200 years from now, you might visit a small trinary star system that's 24.7 trillion miles away from our home, called Alpha Centauri. Now that sounds like a very long way away, in both space and in time, I know. But think about it. 200 years ago, our species was scrambling across this planet's continents using little more than our own two feet, horse-drawn carriages and wagons, and sailing across this planet's great oceans using wooden constructed wind-powered ships. And the greatest journey that we could undertake at that time, that tested our ingenuity, our technology, our ability as our species, as well as the meaning of the word impossible was a mere circumnavigation of our home. So maybe 200 years and 24.7 trillion miles is not that far in space or in time. In short, it is the trench that will make sure, no matter where you go, that you don't take a wrong turn at Pluto or Albuquerque, whichever the case may be. <laughs> nice to hear we have a few Looney Tunes fans in the audience today. For the rest of you all who did not laugh at my joke <laughs> and are thus clearly Disney fans, <laughs> I won't hold it against you. There are a couple of the consoles here that stand out. We have EVA, Extravehicular Activity, or Spacewalks. We like our acronyms here at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. CAPCOM, or I'm sorry, not CAPCOM, MOD, Mission Operations Directorate, which is NASA Management. Public Affairs, PAO. This is the person that will report from Mission Control what's going on in space to NASA television and thus the rest of the world because I, all know, I, I know that we all watch NASA TV, right? <laughs> CAPCOM, there we go is the intermediary between the ground and space. They are usually an astronaut, but in recent years we've kind of had a constant human presence in space, and astronauts are busy people, so we can't always get a hold of one to sit at Capcom anymore, thus we have trained flight controllers to sit there as well, but usually it is an astronaut. Last but not least is the flight director, or flight. This person is the supreme authority on a manned spaceflight mission. No one can override them. They are in charge of the safety of the crew, the safety of the vehicle, and the completion of all mission objectives. In short, ladies and gentlemen, whenever you go into space, wherever your mission might take you, this is where you will call. But this is Houston. This is home. Now, before I let you head off over to Building 9, and first, of course, back out in the cold, I will open it up to any questions that you might have about manned spaceflight, past, present, or perhaps the future. Yes? You watched the last space shuttle mission. Well, very good for you. So did I. It was pretty cool, don't you think? Remember the launch when they had to pause it at 31 seconds? And a little boom at the top of the shuttle they didn't think got all the way over, and they had to pause the countdown at 31 seconds. Can you imagine that being the last four astronauts ever to fly on the shuttle? You have 31 seconds before you get, you know, <clears throat> seven and a half million pounds in the seat of your pants <laughs> shooting you upwards, and then they go, stop. Oh, <laughs> Anything else? Yes. 